I want to thank everybody for joining us today. Uh, my name is Dennis O'Brien. I'm the Director of Marketing here at Jamier Publications. Welcome. Uh, before we begin, just a couple of housekeeping items. One, note all microphones will be muted during the webinar. However, we do encourage you to engage with our speakers by submitting your questions using the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen. Also, the event is being recorded and the recording will be available on our YouTube channel. Today's webinar will be led by Dr. Lawrence Mogbau and Dr. Cynthia Locker, both of McMaster University. They have a wonderful presentation prepared for you today. Dr. Mogbau is a research methods consultant and clinical epidemiologist. He brings a wealth of expertise in designing and analyzing clinical research. He's an associate professor at McMaster University and also leads the biostatistics unit at St. Joseph Healthcare Hamilton. His research spans health systems, strengthening M health and improving HIV care. Dr. Locker is assistant professor at McMaster University and a skilled health research methodologist with the Health Information Research Unit. Her work focuses on using machine learning and natural language processing to enhance evidence-based medicine and knowledge translation. Uh, she has a strong background in digital health, M health, and M health app evaluation. Both Lawrence and Cynthia are published authors with Jamier Publications. Uh, we're excited to have you both join us here today. Uh, I'll turn it over to you. Well, I just want to say hello and good afternoon to everybody out there. Thank you all for making the time to come and listen to our talk. We are very excited to be here. And the talk we are presenting today is based on a published paper, Advice for Junior Faculty Regarding Academic Promotion, What to Worry About and What Not to Worry About. So, um, We've distilled the content from this paper, and that's what we're going to be discussing today. So for those of you who are here as junior faculty who are concerned about whether you will get academic promotion or not, um, what we're here to tell you is that you shouldn't worry. That with a careful strategic approach to your career, you can make it, you can get promotion, you can move from assistant to associate and from associate to full professor. So we have um, about eight tips that we are going to share and we're gonna discuss some of those in detail. And then obviously, if you have any questions about exactly how to implement any of these tips, feel free to put your questions in the chat. So the first thing which we recommend is understanding the fine print about getting promoted. It is important to identify and read all the institutional procedures for advancement. These documents are available either at your department or at the faculty level. So talk to somebody who has these documents and start reading them early, not just when you're up for promotion. Start looking at those documents immediately. It will also help to talk to other faculty who have gone through the same process, who have recently gotten promoted, ask them how they put your documents together, what they put together, and what sort of feedback they received. It might also help you to talk to faculty who sit on tenure and promotions committees so that you can get a sense of the kinds of conversations that they have in terms of what is needed. So our advice for you would be to start putting together a checklist of all the items that are required. It could be um, reports on your teaching, it could be research reports on your publications or the kinds of service you're conducting and your in interactions with students and all of that. Create a checklist and start putting those documents together. The next thing we recommend is that you should ensure that you have some amount of research productivity. Now, there is no set number of publications per year that you should produce because it depends on your discipline and it depends on your department. So what will be helpful for you will be to talk to an administrative person in your department and find out what the average number of um, publications in your department are. Or if you want to be more accurate, look at the median number of publications and target that median. Um, to do this, you should set aside time for writing so that you can actually reach your publication targets. And if you are concerned about not having things to do, there are several kinds of research output that you can create. For example, it helps to publish every stage of a research project, not just the final paper. So you could publish the protocol, you could publish the pilot stages, you could publish qualitative data linked to a quantitative study. Um, it also helps to publish 
educational activities. For example, if you created a new course, that could be a good thing to publish. Likewise, workshop reports are also helpful to publish. But the key thing here is setting aside time for writing and setting writing targets. The next thing which we recommend is that you also set aside some time to secure funding. And one of the best ways to do this is to join a mailing list for funding opportunities, where you can look at the funding opportunities that you're eligible for, and then you put together those grants. And in order to be successful, there are three things which you must consider. The first thing is grant writing is not necessarily a skill that everybody has. So if there are opportunities for you to learn grant writing in terms of taking workshops or seminars, by all means, you should. Um, also note that many institutions have support for grant writing. There would be people who could help you review your budget. I understand many scientists have not been trained in budgeting and managing and human resources. And this is where you know, the admins in your departments can come in handy to explain what FTEs are, explain the salaries of research assistants and research coordinators and that sort of thing. And the final piece of advice we have with regards to funding is that perseverance matters. Um, CHR funding rates are close to 15%, if not less. And grants that get funded tend to be grants that have been submitted several times. So remember to persevere so that you can succeed. Obviously, most of um, the fa junior faculty have some amount of teaching responsibility, and it could be 50% of your time, 75% of your time, or 25% of your time. It is important to teach as required in your contract and not necessarily go beyond that. Otherwise, you're using up time that you could be doing for something else. But when you teach, what is important is to document evidence of teaching. So make sure you have a document which covers all the courses where you're a coordinator, where you're a guest lecturer, where you're a lecturer, or where you are um, a teaching assistant, whatever roles you play with regards to teaching. Delivering workshops and facilitating other forms of education also count, and that should also be in your teaching portfolio. In case you created a new workshop, you should also put that in there. And then finally, Again, not all faculty is trained in teaching, right? Teaching is a profession which um, is bestowed upon us as mere scientists. And if there are any resources in your department or your faculty that you can use to enhance your teaching skills, by all means, we encourage you to take these um, courses and improve your teaching skills. And also add that information to your portfolio showing that you're actually um, trying to improve your teaching skills. The next thing is service. Um, most of the time, junior faculty will have some amount of service roles in their contracts. It could be anywhere between five to 10%. And we recommend that you choose strategically the kinds of service you want to do and use it to create opportunities. For example, I have sat on the IT committees in my department so that I could get a sense of what I need to do to get access to REDCap and how to share it with other people. Um, I have also sat on the tenure and promotion committee so that I can see exactly what happens in those committees, what conversations they have, and you know what the red flags are and how, how to avoid those things. And you can also sit on an admissions committee. This gives you a first-hand access to the incoming students and you know, you can pick the ones that you want from there. So several of these committees exist and our advice to you is to be strategic, right? Use the committees to your own benefit. Join the committees where there's a clear benefit to you and it'll be something that will help you get promotion. The next thing which cannot be overstated is using time wisely. And here we just emphasize um, developing time management skills and priority setting. So these are skills which can be learned by talking to mentors or by reading books on time management and actively practicing. But what helps is setting targets and knowing how long it takes you to complete specific tasks. So you should have targets for research, for teaching, for service, and you should evaluate all of these yearly so that you can see if you are making any progress. And the last bit of um, 
advice we have here is that you should also set aside time for promotion activities. You set aside time to make sure your CV is complete, all the activities you've done throughout the year are carefully documented so that you don't have to rely on your memory to identify a course that you lectured three years ago. Because usually what happens is you will forget and you will miss out on enriching your CV. We would be remiss if we didn't say um, that mentorship is of value in academia. We recommend identifying a good mentor and seeking advice on how to get promotion. And we also recommend talking to the promotion teams in your department to find out exactly what the timelines are, what kinds of documents they need to see, if there's any specific formatting requirement that has to be put in place so that you're ready, so that nothing takes you by surprise. The other thing which will help you to get promotion is collaboration, right? In several institutions, collaboration is key. In others, not so much. But it helps, especially young researchers, to join highly productive groups. And that way, you meet up with some of your publication and research requirements. And sometimes you also meet up with your grant requirements because you're working with um, very collaborative groups. And the idea here is you join these groups and you identify opportunities to co collaborate and to contribute to these groups. And you also see what you can benefit from joining these groups. It's critical because there is no way you can grow on your own, you know? And there's, there's um, an African saying that if you want to go fast go alone but if you want to go far you should go together you should go with people so that um, you know people can support you throughout your journey so these are the key messages which we have for you today and um, they're summarized on this slide so essentially what we've said today is you should know the institutional requirements for advancement you should work on getting those publications aim to secure funding teach effectively provide service efficiently, manage your time appropriately and set priorities, um, get a mentor, and also work in a collaborative space. Great. We will now take questions. Yeah, yeah, and I just wanted to um, jump in. So thanks, Lawrence, for going through all of those tips and, and hopefully uh, the folks on the webinar are not feeling um, completely overwhelmed because all of this is manageable, right? And that's why we start with, with um, not to worry. Uh, some of the things that have been, that I've set in place are the very project management based, um, making sure that I have goals and tracking and having live documents where you keep track of these things. As Lawrence mentioned, you can forget uh, quite readily some of the activities that you're involved in. Um, and also the importance of setting boundaries. So I am seeing that we're starting to get some questions. Yes, we um, are. Yeah. So let's see. Um, question one, how do you create collaborations to be involved in projects where you're not necessarily the, the first author or the primary investigator, principal investigator? Yeah, so that's that's an excellent question. Um, I can tell you my experience as a methodologist, how I get on board several projects. So the first thing is um, you come to the table with something, right? You're coming to provide your input. Sometimes it's a study that could use with a qualitative piece, which I am bringing up to, to, to the table. Sometimes they need biostatistical support or they need some form of design support. And that's how um, I get involved in these projects. Um, and also sometimes the project might be of interest to one of my trainees, for example, and I say, hey, you're doing this project, it's really interesting. Can my trainee get involved so that they learn how to do the process? And then I support them and I build their capacity and you know, we jointly build the capacity for the students involved. And if you're working in a collaborative space, um, people generally say yes. So what, what should happen is if you're in a truly collaborative space on the projects where you're the PI, you invite other people. People, right and once you've built a reputation on other projects where people are the PI they also invite you to work with them and a lot of this has to do with not necessarily being the smartest person but being a nice person to work with and if people truly enjoy working with you they will try to involve you in as many projects as possible second question uh, what are your recommendations for finding a mentor 
Cynthia? Yeah, so some, uh, certainly our department has a, a structured a, a, um, mechanism where we are matched with a mentor when we're hired. Uh, but I think it's also important to take advantage of sort of informal mentoring, right? So Lawrence is not my immediate mentor, but we've engaged in other ways. So so it's sort of an informal um, mentorship approach and, and finding the people who are doing the things that um, you'd like to also be doing <laughs> and ask it, you know, 20 minute coffee chat over Zoom. Uh, can we talk about some of the strategies and and trying to get um, feedback that way? I find that my informal network of for mentors is actually much broader because it, it, they might be smaller pieces around teaching, around research from different people versus the um, my my official um, amazing mentor. Yeah, so, so, so seek what, out what, people you like. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. In in line with that, what I do is I look for senior researchers who emulate the values I would like to have in the future. And I say, you know what? I want to be like Dennis in the next 10 years. So I'm going to start talking to Dennis. I'm going to make Dennis my friend and I'm going to listen to everything Dennis has to say. That's great. Um, it sounds like from, from your presentation that there, uh, and what we're getting questions on is that a lot of this isn't really documented on exactly what you need to do, that you really need to go out and do some of your own research. Um, what are, what are the best places for them to start looking for such things as such as the average number of publications um, and some of the requirements for for promotion? Yeah, so that's that that's an excellent question. It turns out um, some of this information may not be found at the department level because these are university level documents. So you need to talk to somebody at the faculty or maybe at um, the president's office and they have all of these documents. Everything is, is written because if for some reason you are not um, approved for promotion, then they have that document to say, well, here's a document that says you are supposed to do 10 things and you've done only five of those things, so we can't promote you. So what we are encouraging you to do is to find that document, that marking sheet, which they use to evaluate you and use that to prepare yourselves. And, and again, it's not a document that um, will be proactively shared with you. You will have to go out and ask for it um, and 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 you know, read it and, and use it. Here's another question. Um, what are the key components to have a successful funding application? So funding funding is, is very interesting because um, the first thing is you need to have an exciting idea. And um, it should be an exciting idea. It should be new. The methodology should be sound. Um, the outcomes you're looking for should be relevant to participants. The impact on the population should be obvious. And generally, people want to see impact with regards to policy, practice, and research. And those should be outlined carefully. But then again, even for the least exciting ideas, grantsmanship is key. Right, so it's it's a little bit of a marketing skill. You need to write a convincing argument for why they should give you the money, right? So I have seen not so exciting studies get published because the grant was written very, very well in a very convincing way. Whereas I have seen extremely good ideas which will probably revolutionize the world delivered poorly, right? And it just doesn't get funded. So um, I, I think that the first submission is testing the waters to get a sense of what the panel is interested in. There are some panels that are heavily methodology focused. There are some that will grill you for your EDI. There are some that will grill you because you haven't made the case for why this research has to be done, right? Usually it's a balance of one or more of those things, but, but it's important to have the bare minimum have an exciting idea, demonstrate impact, and deliver the writing in the grant appropriately. I love what you said during the presentation, just being persistent and how important that is as well. Um, yeah. Here's one around what to do your research on. So which is better, focusing deeply on your own field of expertise or exploring a broader range of experiences and, and uh, maybe expanding the scope to be more interdisciplinary? I think it might depend on the field. Uh, partly, you know, we're here with Jamie, so 
any digital health research is interdisciplinary, but right by its nature. Um, and, and I think it's also important that you do what you want to be doing too, right? So, so pursuing the ideas and the collaborations and the kind of work that you want to do will, will bring, um, the collaborators and will help you build that and build your own expertise. So I, I, I'm an interdisciplinary researcher with a broad focus. So, so, so that's my perspective on it rather than, than narrowing in. Yeah. Yeah, and I would say there is value in both, but it depends on how much time you want to allocate to each. You should allocate more time to the things that are in your discipline and in your in in your area of expertise. Um, for somebody like me who is a methodologist, I find that um, my job is to support other people's research. So my CV includes pediatrics, anesthesia e-health, public health, everything you, you can think of. But then I have my own focus, which is methodological research and HIV research. So I do research on methodology. And I have, um, I would say, 50% 50, 50, 50 of my time is dedicated to, to both of those things. Because in as much as when you're putting in grants, they want to see what you have identified, what you have done as an individual, there is also value in showing that you're able to collaborate with other people. And, and that's where the interdisciplinary work comes in. Here's a follow-up on research grants and awards. Uh, the, the question is, some institutions stifle the early career researchers grant awards and suppress junior faculty. Is, do you have any advice on that? Has that happened to either of you? I'm not particularly clear on what um, is meant by suppressing. My understanding is that um, they want junior faculty to succeed, at least for, for, for the most part. But... Um, I think flexibility in the kinds of grants you're submitting makes a difference. For example, as a junior investigator, um, the institution might not feel that you're ready to apply for a chair position in the first or second year of your faculty, right? But you may be more ready for that kind of grant further down the line. So um, I think the best approach is to start small and ramp up, right? So, um, as a junior faculty, what I did was um, instead of targeting the million dollar grants first, I started with the small grants, 10,000, 40,000, 80,000, 100,000, and it kept building. And part of a successful grant is also showing that you have previously managed grants successfully, right? And when you show that you've had a grant and it was successful and you delivered, nobody checks to see if it was a $5,000 grant or a $10,000 grant. They know you have successfully completed the grant and therefore they're willing to give you more money. So I think um, that approach might might lead to some amount of success. That also builds your grant writing skills. Skills. Go along. Yeah. yeah, success leads to greater success. Um, yeah. Here's an interesting question. Uh, how do you manage your time and prioritize writing and research over teaching prep or service? Do you have any tips or tools that you might use to do that? Um, I, I use my calendar religiously, <laughs> right? Yeah. Locking in the tasks yes. um, and, and tracking what I need to get done. So longer term tasks versus shorter term. Um, and also, and, and I think Lawrence alluded to this, is making sure the balance of those activities are reflected in what you've been hired to do. Um, I'm 50% teaching, so so I know that my research is relegated to a smaller period of my, of my um, available time. So, you know, it, that depends on everybody's, what their contract is, but trying to maintain that balance um, and setting boundaries, saying no yeah. to things that might creep in because uh, I, I know I it's the shiny, you know, ooh, that sounds really interesting. That's really great. Um, but that will chip away at the time that you have available for the other things that you need to do. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So one thing I recommend doing is once you've gotten to a stable state, if you take on any new thing, you should drop something else. Right. Every new thing requires you to drop something because you can't create new time. All you're doing is eating into your personal time. So in terms of calculating how much time to spend, it can get tricky if you teach in multiple courses, different times of the year and, you know, things are spread out. So my teaching responsibility is 25 percent. So I make sure I teach only in the winter. So January to April accounts for 25% of teaching time. I have a full course that I coordinate and any guest lectures, I try to fit them in that time as well. So 
in April, I know I'm done with my teaching responsibilities for the year, and then I focus on other things. But absolutely block away time for writing. Use your calendar, put in those spaces for writing. Some people have recommended having one writing day per week. I think I think with that, we're going to wrap things up. I want to thank Lawrence and Cynthia for uh, your insightful presentation. Uh, and thank you for everyone who joined us, as well as uh, special thanks to those who submitted questions today. I hope you found the session valuable. As a reminder, the webinar was recorded. It will be made available on our YouTube channel. So, uh, and please be sure to check out our upcoming webinars. Uh, we look forward to seeing you again. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.